A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Dick Cavett was a famous comedian and writer who hosted his own late-night talk show starting in 1969. Like his competitor, The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, celebrities, musicians, authors, and politicians flocked to the show, often promoting their latest project and usually themselves. To appear on either show was considered quite an accomplishment. They were gatekeepers to some of the largest television audiences in America. So, when a former Army captain named Dr. Jeffrey McDonald appeared on the Dick Cavett Show on December 15, 1970, all of his family and friends, including his in-laws, were watching. Just a few months earlier, though, Jeff was in a very different situation. His audience at that time was an army courtroom in North Carolina, where he was on trial for the brutal murder of his pregnant wife and two young children. He was cleared of those charges due in large part to the ardent support of his father-in-law, Freddie Kassab. Freddie and his wife, Mildred, watched as Cabot interviewed their son-in-law, excited to have such a large platform to bring the real killers to justice. Freddie had just returned home from Washington, D.C., where he had spent four days hand-delivering 500 copies of a letter to lawmakers asking them to assist with their search for the killer. The trip yielded no results, so this interview was very important to their case. But instead of pleading for help finding the killers of his wife and daughters, Freddie watched as Jeff laughed and made jokes with the famous host. And rather than mourning the horrific murder of his family, Jeff talked about how much he suffered, even exaggerating his physical injuries. In his gut, He knew then that Jeffrey McDonald murdered his stepdaughter and two grandchildren, and he would spend every day of the next nine years attempting to prove it to the world. Mike Williams set off on a hunting trip in a North Florida lake where it was thought he met his fate in the jaws of a vicious alligator. Except that's not what happened. And after the uncovering of a secret love affair, the truth would finally be revealed. Binge all episodes of Over My Dead Body, Gone Hunting, right now, ad-free, on Wondery Plus. From Wondery and Campside Media comes Season 3 of the hit podcast Suspect. This is a story of two victims, one murdered in cold blood, one in prison for a crime he did not commit. Listen to Suspect, Five Shots in the Dark, wherever you get your podcasts, or binge all eight episodes ad-free, on Wondery Plus. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Jeffrey McDonald. At 3.40 in the morning on February 17, 1970, a telephone operator in Fayetteville, North Carolina, received a call 
asking for help from the military police and an ambulance. She transferred the call to the MP headquarters at Fort Bragg, which was the nearest army base. When the desk sergeant answered the phone, he heard a voice say, 540 Castle Drive, help, 540 Castle Drive, stabbing. Then the line disconnected, but the caller called back and in a very faint voice repeated his first message, adding only the word hurry at the end. Military police arrived at the address on Castle Drive within 10 minutes. They entered through an open back door and upon reaching the master bedroom, discovered the body of 26-year-old Colette McDonald lying on the floor next to the bed. Her face and head were badly beaten and both of her arms were broken. Her body was covered by a torn blue pajama top and she was drenched in blood. Colette was also five months pregnant. Next to her lay the body of her husband, Captain Jeffrey McDonald, a military doctor at Fort Bragg. He wore the bottoms to the blue top covering Colette's chest. The captain was positioned with his face on her chest and an arm wrapped around her neck. There was a paring knife on the floor and on the headboard of the bed, the word pig was written in blood. As the MPs were examining the crime scene, Jeffrey began to move. He had multiple small puncture wounds, cuts, bruises on his body and arms, fingernail scratches to his face and chest, and a clean surgical stab wound between his seventh and eighth ribs. He begged the MPs to check on his children. The MPs then discovered an even more gruesome scene. The two girls, Kimberly and Kristen, ages five and two, were brutally stabbed to death in their rooms. As Jeffrey went in and out of consciousness, he told the MPs that his family was attacked by four hippies, three men and a woman. The woman had long blonde hair, wore high boots, and a floppy hat. Jeff told them that she carried a candle and kept saying, quote, acid is groovy, kill the pigs. Jeff was taken by ambulance to the army hospital where the ER physician said that the stab wound was only five eighths of an inch deep but it was deep enough to partially collapse his lung. He also had a mild concussion and had to be given a sedative to calm down. The description of the stab wound as being surgical means that it was perfect, as if a surgeon did it. The edges were not jagged. It would also mean that the recipient of the surgical stab wound, in this case, Jeffrey, was not fighting with his attacker. He was remaining still. The fact that the stab wound was only about half an inch deep, five-eighths of an inch to be specific, means whoever was stabbing him definitely was not using much force and did not intend to hurt him seriously. Additionally, All of the puncture wounds were very shallow. When police interviewed Jeff in the hospital, he repeated his account of the hippie intruders who had attacked his family. He then described the events leading up to the attack. His wife had come home after a class she was taking, and they watched TV. Then Colette went to bed, while he stayed up to read until about two in the morning. He then went to the master bedroom and discovered their daughter, Kristen, had climbed into bed with Colette and wet the bed. After carrying Kristen back to her bed, he took a comforter and went to sleep on the living room sofa. Sometime after falling asleep, he claimed 
that he awoke to the sound of his five-year-old daughter, Kimberly, screaming. Then he heard Colette yelling, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? As he jumped from the sofa, he was struck down by one of the three male assailants, one black man and two white, with a club or a baseball bat over his head several times. Then he felt a sudden sharp pain in his right side. That, of course, would be the barely inflicted stab wound. He also said another person was in the living room, the woman with the floppy hat, who he had mentioned earlier. The whole time he was being attacked, the female intruder held a lit candle while chanting, acid is groovy, kill the pigs, and hit him, hit him again. Then he said he was knocked unconscious. He maintained that he woke up in the hallway leading to the bedrooms and the intruders were gone. Then he says he immediately went to check on Colette in the master bedroom, where he found her with a knife lodged in her chest. He said he pulled it out and put his pajama top over her chest to stop the bleeding and keep her warm so she wouldn't go into shock. Then he attempted CPR. Let me tell you what's wrong with that story. Most of you know I was a registered nurse for many, many years. Early in my nursing career, I was a psychiatric nurse, but I periodically moonlit on my day off in emergency rooms so I could keep up my clinical skills. Number one rule in an emergency room, in fact, we even had a sign at Northwestern in one of the rooms that says, don't take it out. Meaning, if there is a foreign object in someone's body, do not remove it. What we did would prepare the patient for the operating room. Surgeons would be right there. We'd be doing transfusions. The last thing to do would be to take the knife out. And yet, somehow, Jeffrey McDonald didn't know that. Secondly, he did CPR. If she was still bleeding then her heart was still pumping. So why would CPR be necessary? And you want to know what happens when CPR is done with someone that has severe puncture wounds in their chest? The blood is expressed from the wound at an even faster rate because of the pressure. Apparently, Jeffrey McDonald must not have been in class that day when all of that was discussed. Then he went on to say, After realizing his wife was dead, he checked on his two daughters and also tried to resuscitate them with CPR. Meanwhile, back at the apartment, investigators from Army's Criminal Investigation Division, or CID, started collecting evidence. One piece of evidence really intrigued them a recent issue of Esquire magazine with a story on drugs, hippies, cults, and the 1969 Sharon Tate murder. The article detailed similar accounts of cults performing ritualistic killings and chanting, acid is groovy, just like the woman Jeff had described in the floppy hat. The Manson family, the cult who murdered Sharon Tate, who was also pregnant at the time, also scrawled the word pig in blood on the wall at the crime scene. And now hippies had broken into the McDonald's house, chanted about LSD, killed a pregnant woman, and wrote the word pig in blood. I was 19 years old in the summer of 1969. I lived in California. I remember everything about that summer and the Manson murders. It was horrible. Not only was it a huge California story, it was a national story. Every day, headline news about that case. Hard to imagine Dr. Jeffrey McDonald didn't hear about it as well. Police quickly turned up a second knife, an ice pick, and a bloody piece of lumber. 
The wood was found outside the back door in the yard and was later identified as similar to the wood slats from Kimberly's bed. CID investigators soon realized there was something very unique about the McDonald family that would help them reconstruct the crime scene. Each family member had different blood types. So by analyzing the location of the blood pools and splatters, they were able to track who had been in which room of the home at the time they were killed. And what do you think? Their findings did not match up to Jeff's account of what happened. Surprise, surprise. In addition to the blood-soaked carpet, Colette's blood was splattered on the master bedroom walls and ceiling. But a massive amount of her blood was also found in two-year-old Kristen's bedsheets and the floor near Kristen's bed. Blood spattered on Kristen's bedroom wall and floor was both Colette's and Kristen's. And a bloody footprint made from a naked foot next to Kristen's bed leading out of the bedroom was determined to be Colette's. There was a lack of fingerprints anywhere. Even the phone Jeff used to call police did not have his fingerprints on it. And the foot traffic of the 26 military police gathered at the scene muddled any evidence or clues they would have obtained from footprints. But one of the most important pieces of evidence the CID used to find their killer was 81 small blue threads found on and under the victim's bodies. These were from the punctured blue pajama top on top of Colette's abdomen. There were 19 of these threads in five-year-old Kimberly's bedroom and two more threads in Kristen's room. And one of the threads was under the toddler's fingernails. They could all be traced back to Jeff McDonald's blue pajama top. The pajama top threads and the blood evidence collected in the different rooms would lead CID investigators to arrest and charge the sole survivor, Jeffrey McDonald. On April 6, 1970, approximately two months after the murders, the CID named Jeffrey the primary suspect in the murders of Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen McDonald and sequestered him under military guard. The Army initiated an Article 32, similar to an arraignment or pretrial hearing in civilian criminal court. His mother hired a flashy civilian lawyer, Bernie Siegel, to assist his military lawyers. Both McDonald's mother and his in-laws, Colette's mother, Mildred, and stepfather, Freddie Kassab, spoke out against the charges. They believed Jeff was innocent. The Army prosecutor theorized, based on the evidence gathered, that Jeff killed his family after a physical confrontation started between Colette and Jeff in the master bedroom. He believed that upon hearing noises, five-year-old Kimberly woke up and interrupted their fight. The prosecutor hypothesized that McDonald hit Kimberly intentionally or unintentionally while she was standing in the doorway. Realizing what he had done, he then carried Kimberly to her bed and bludgeoned and stabbed her there. Colette, not yet dead, went to protect two-year-old Kristen in her bedroom. McDonald murdered Colette and Kristen in Kristen's bedroom and used a sheet from his bed to drag Colette's body back to the master bedroom. Jeff's lawyer was able to cast doubt on the prosecution's theory due to the military police and the Army's CID investigators' botched handling of the investigation and the evidence. A large majority of the evidence the prosecutors were relying on, including the pajama top and blue threads, had been lost or thrown away before 
the Article 32 took place. And then there was the woman in the floppy hat who Jeff claimed was one of the intruders. A military police officer testified that he saw a blonde woman in a floppy hat about half a mile from McDonald's home as he responded to the crime scene. And later, another man came forward and said he saw his female neighbor, Helena Stokely, a known drug addict returning home with three men at 4 a.m. that night. He claimed she was wearing a floppy hat, boots, and a blonde wig. To Bernie Siegel, Jeff's attorney, that was the golden ticket to proving Jeff's innocence. And he capitalized on it. By focusing on Helena Stokely, Siegel was able to turn eyes away from his client and toward her. On October 13, 1970, after a six-month investigation, the Army colonel presiding over a hearing on whether McDonald should be court-martialed dismissed all charges. But this was not the end of McDonald's legal saga, though. Nine years later, he was back in court, a civilian court this time, facing murder charges in the death of his wife and two children. And this time, Jeffrey McDonald was not so lucky. Jeffrey Robert McDonald was born on October 12, 1943, the second of three children of Robert and Dorothy McDonald. He and his siblings grew up in a lower middle class neighborhood in Patchogue on New York's Long Island. There is no evidence of a traumatic childhood. In fact, the McDonald household was said to be very tight knit. Jeff's father was strict, but not physically abusive. He did, however, demand total obedience. The former chief of psychiatry from Walter Reed Army Hospital later testified that Jeff talked about his father as a very masculine man and a leader, and that he was, quote, a man who was constantly at battle with the world when he didn't need to be. It was at the end of the eighth grade, however, when his life completely changed. That was when 14-year-old Jeff met Colette Stevenson. Colette was also 14, but her young life had been scarred by trauma after her father committed suicide when she was only 12. The next year, her mother remarried a man named Freddie Kassab, who also was a widower. Freddie lost his wife and daughter in World War II, so he looked on Colette as the daughter he lost, and she loved and considered him her real father. Jeff and Colette began dating in the ninth grade. They claimed they fell in love holding hands during the 1959 movie A Summer Place, but their relationship was a bit rocky, and the summer after freshman year, Colette broke up with Jeff, and he claimed he was devastated. In mid-November of their sophomore year, Jeff abruptly disappeared from Patchogue. He went to live with a family in Baton, Texas. The Andrews, who he only briefly met once before, There is not a lot of information about this time, but in Joe McGinnis' famous book about the murders, Fatal Vision, he writes that this really bothered the investigators on the case. Quote, It seemed odd to them that an outstanding student and athlete who was having no disciplinary problem of any kind should suddenly be removed from his high school. 
and be sent more than 1,500 miles away to remain away through both Thanksgiving and Christmas for almost four months. It was later uncovered that Jeff received the invitation to visit the Andrews family after he and his brother Jay dined with the married couple in New York City. They apparently had a great time and partied into the night at different clubs all over the city. I don't think I need to remind you that Jeff was a sophomore in high school at the time. That means 14 years old. What was he doing? Or moreover, what was that couple doing? And I certainly have to wonder, what were Jeff's parents doing? That doesn't sound like something that would happen in a strict household. A few weeks after Mrs. Andrews returned to Texas, her husband informed her that he was bringing Jeff to their home for a visit. So Jeff and Mr. Andrews drove across the country from New York to the Texas Gulf Coast. When asked why, Mrs. Andrews replied, quote, I think my husband Jack was just attracted to the boy. Frankly, it seemed real strange to me that the family would just let him come down to stay for so long with people they scarcely knew. In fact, I had never met the parents at all, just the boys that one night at dinner. The couple's son later remarked that Jeff overstayed his welcome and revealed they had a physical altercation toward the end of his stay. Quote, The thing I remember most clearly about Jeff is that he was always striving to be the center of attention, and not just in the normal way. With Jeff, it was like a crusade. He had to try to look the best at everything. According to McGinnis, investigators uncovered a recurrent rumor of difficulty within the McDonald family, including one to the effect that Jeffrey had been banished by his father in the aftermath of a brutal fight in which he had badly injured his older brother, Jay. One family friend even remarked that McDonald's mother had often said one of Jeff's goals in life was to flatten Jay. So great was his envy over favoritism shown to his older brother, said to be. It seems to me that Jeff resorted to physical violence both easily and indiscriminately from his youth. Jeff eventually went back to Patchogue and graduated in the spring of 1962. He was awarded a three-year scholarship to Princeton and was in the pre-med program. During his sophomore year in college, Jeff began dating Colette again, and within a few months, the 19-year-old was pregnant. Colette dropped out of college, and on September 14, 1963, they married. Their first daughter, Kimberly, was born the following April, and after Jeff graduated from Princeton, the young family moved to Chicago so he could attend medical school at Northwestern University. During his second year at medical school, Jeff's father died at the age of only 48. This greatly impacted Jeff's life and his brother Jay, who became deeply involved with drugs and spiraled into alcoholism and drug addiction. By the time Jeff graduated medical school in 1968, the family, which now included a second daughter, Kristen, moved to New York for Jeff's internship. Jeff worked multiple jobs to pay the bills and rarely got to see his family. Wanting a change, 25-year-old Jeff joined the Army and volunteered to become a Special Forces physician. But Jeff was not content just to serve. He wanted to serve in the branch he felt was the best. He earned the title of Green Beret Captain and served as a military surgeon. During his basic training, Jeff had several extramarital affairs. 
He never hid the fact that he was married, and he was popular with fellow soldiers and other women alike. Everyone adored him. In September of 1969, Jeff once again moved his family, this time to officers' quarters at Fort Bragg, the Army base in North Carolina. During the day, he worked as a surgeon there, and at night, he was moonlighting at a civilian hospital. With her husband working most of the time, Colette decided to finish her college degree. She enrolled in an extension course on the base to study psychology. By February 1970, Colette was pregnant with her third child. This pregnancy, like the others, was not planned. And some of her friends reported that she and Jeff were not necessarily thrilled. Her first two pregnancies were cesarean births, and she was worried about the danger that another cesarean posed. It also put a strain on their marriage. Not only would there be another mouth to feed, but Jeff reportedly was not attracted to Colette when she was pregnant. In the three weeks leading up to the murders, Jeff lost between 12 and 15 pounds. Turns out he was using the drug Escatrol, which was a popular stimulant used for weight loss in the 70s. In the book Fatal Vision, it is hypothesized that Jeff was under the influence of amphetamines and probably in a rage at the time of the killings. However, extensive research into amphetamines and aggression did not support the notion that amphetamines increase human aggression. Do they make you edgy? Yes. Can they make you nervous? Yes. Do they turn you into a killer? No. That said, we do not know if any of this played a part in the eventual violence that occurred on February 17, 1970, but it couldn't have helped. Now, KP listeners, I know what you're thinking. Why hasn't she said the word narcissist yet? Well, here you go. He is absolutely a narcissist, a malignant narcissist. And here are a couple reasons why I say that. Number one, he made certain to participate in every, and I mean every interview he could, not really talking about the murder of his family, but more focused on the effect it had on him. Second, he told one of the most outrageous stories I've ever heard, with the exception of Jody Arias, about what happened the night of the murders. Only a narcissist would believe that no one would ever question their story. Additionally, if he felt he was being challenged, he would double down. Anytime law enforcement and eventually his own in-laws would question him about a statement he had made earlier or a discrepancy in his story, he would erupt in rage that he was being challenged. For example, after reading the transcript from the Army's Article 32 hearing, Colette's stepfather, Freddie, asked Jeff about the extramarital affairs he discussed in the transcript. Jeff became irate shouting at Freddie that he was being framed and that it was all untrue. This was Jeff's and pretty much any narcissist's M.O. They turn every question into a personal affront. How dare you not believe me? They try to make you feel bad or out of line for questioning them. After Jeff was cleared by the Army, he requested and received an honorable discharge. He then moved to New York, where he resumed his medical career. He told his father-in-law that he had hunted down and killed one of the hippies that killed Colette and the kids. 
This was, of course, not true. But don't forget, when a narcissist says or does anything, it's okay, and it will be believed. All of these conversations were captured on tape by Freddie Kassab. After Colette's death, Freddie trusted no one, so he recorded every phone conversation that he had connected to the murders. And in these tapes, we can hear the outrageous lies that Jeff told Colette's family and his anger at being called out when his information was inconsistent or was just a flat-out lie. After his second murder trial and conviction, Joe McGinnis's book, Fatal Vision, was released. But it was not the book that Jeff wanted or expected. He was furious. He had contracted Joe McGinnis to write the story for him, and they had become good friends. But Joe, like Freddie, began to see that Jeff's story was not adding up, and he began to suspect that Jeff was guilty of the murders. Needless to say, Jeff felt betrayed and sued the author for, hold on your hats, $30 million for obtaining the story under false pretenses. He won $325,000 in that lawsuit, but made hundreds of thousands of dollars in the made-for-TV miniseries of Fatal Vision that aired the next year in 1984. The miniseries was the network's highest-rated non-sports show of the year, with an estimated 60 million Americans watching the two-night show. Jeff used all of his profits to mount appeals for a new trial, to no avail. An Army psychiatrist who testified at the grand jury said Jeff wanted to be Superman or a He-Man. The doctor said that it was a defense against his latent homosexual desires. When I first read that, I thought, oh, here we go. That is so Freudian. Every psychiatrist thinks this, that, or the other can be blamed on latent homosexual desires. But in this case... I think the psychiatrist was right. Quote, by homosexual desires, I don't mean he's a practicing homosexual. Far from it. But that he has a drive to be a homosexual, which he does not act on. But he has homosexual desires and certain psychopathic tendencies. That is, telling me about his extramarital affairs again and again, almost being too much of a man. When a grand juror asked the psychiatrist if challenging his manliness or his sexuality could pose a threat or set him off, the doctor answered in the affirmative. Quote, This guy's a Green Beret tiger in black boots, and I think that would be quite a challenge. After a few more questions about what stress would do to a person with his personality traits, another juror asked one more question. Quote, at any time during McDonald's talking to you, when he was talking about Colette's kindness and gentleness, did he ever say to you that he loved her? The doctor answered, that word was not mentioned. That word was not used. I thought that was remarkable as well. It is not remarkable when you understand that a malignant narcissist like Jeffrey McDonald only really loves one person, himself. After the Dick Cavett show and his realizations about Jeff's guilt, Freddy Kassab made it his mission to bring down the man he felt responsible for the death of his stepdaughter and grandchildren. He went through the Article 32 transcript line by line 
and found every inconsistency. He then worked hand-in-hand with investigators to bring down the man he once believed they were persecuting. The dip cavity appearance also inspired the CID to open a second investigation into the murders, especially since Jeff accused the CID of incompetence while on the program. At the same time, Jeff's team ramped up their defense, concentrating on Helena Stokely. For years, Helena told people she had been in Jeff's house the night of the murders. His legal team finally managed to convince her to tell her story on camera. The problem with that? Helena's story kept changing. Helena Stokely was a heroin abuser, and that made her memory very hazy. She repeatedly said she could not remember whether she was at the McDonald residence or not. And two months after the murders, she checked into a mental institution where she was diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder. Lastly, there was not one fingerprint or trace of her in the McDonald house. You could say Helena was not a reliable witness. At the end of April 1974, Freddie Kassab petitioned the federal courts to convene a grand jury to investigate the case and decide whether to charge McDonald. And that August, a grand jury in North Carolina convened. Jeffrey McDonald was finally indicted for the murders of Colette, Kimberly, and Kristen in January of 1975. And it would take four more years before Jeff's trial started. During the trial, the prosecution slowly and deliberately disproved every claim the defense presented, including Helena Stokely, who admitted on the stand that she was too stoned to remember whether she did anything or not. Jeff was found guilty of two counts of second-degree murder in the deaths of Colette and Kimberly and one count of first-degree murder for the death of Kristen. He was sentenced to three life sentences to be served consecutively. To see a judge sentence someone to three consecutive life sentences is highly unusual. He was sending a message. You aren't going anywhere. A series of appeals were filed, and Jeff was briefly let out of prison, if you can believe that. However, in March of 1982, the Supreme Court reversed the appeal and sent Jeff back to prison, where he is today. Jeff continued to file appeals. His new wife, who he married in prison, is a constant champion for his cause. He would have been up for parole, but Jeff will still not admit his guilt. Typical narcissistic move. In September of 2021, after years of denied appeals, Jeff finally dropped his last attempt at freedom. Now 78 years old, Jeffrey McDonald is in prison at the Cumberland, Maryland's Federal Correctional Institution. Jeff strived his whole life to be the best at everything. But in the end, it turns out that he was not the best when it came to his appeals. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey.
From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Story research and additional writing by Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Senior audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Lindsay Whistler, Colin Modell, and Jada Williams are production assistants. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Joaquin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Tree Fort and Marshall Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Tree Fort Media. Yeah.